Okay, when you are. Hello, we're here with Nicole Thomas Kennedy, who's running for Seattle City Attorney. Uh, would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Certainly. Hi, my name is Nicole Thomas Kennedy, and I decided to run for city attorney. Um, first, when I realized that Pete Holmes was running unopposed. Um, and second, when um, it kind of was born out of uh, the fact that I worked in Seattle Municipal Court and um, was a public defender for four years. And uh, that combined with the protests that happened over the summer, um, I realized that there was nobody running on an, well, and there was no one that was going to run on an abolition platform. And I think that's what's needed. And I think that's what uh, Seattle voters should have a choice for that. Um, I know that, um, I, I'm not running on a campaign of progressive prosecution. I'm running on a campaign of non-prosecution. And the, in terms of abolition, I think the best place to start would be at the Seattle City Attorney's Office. And the reason I say that is because the City Attorney's Office only deals with misdemeanors. Um, so low-level crimes that are punishable by less than a year in jail. And I really do think that there are better ways that we can deal with those crimes. Um, as a public defender there, I really, I was shocked at how much it is actually about race and, uh, and poverty and disability. And that's, um, those are the people that end up in Seattle Municipal Court um, are among the most vulnerable in Seattle. And I don't see the point in prosecuting people for sleeping under an awning or stealing a sandwich or something like that. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that want to be hard on those people and put them in jail, but there's no um, life without parole for stealing a sandwich. People are going to get out eventually and they're human and they're going to be hungry. So um, I think that we should stop throwing away thousands of dollars uh, prosecuting people for survival crimes or um, just crimes in things of poverty that can be dealt with in many other more cost-effective, compassionate ways that actually further public safety. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And so now we'll move into the prepared questions. Um, I dropped the first one into the chat and if we can start with Summer. Hi, do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a kind of a, like the Supreme Court sort of created the idea of qualified immunity. And I think when I think back on, like, I mean, especially just the protest this summer, it was so obvious um, that officers were lying about things. There was people put in jail with probable cause statements that didn't amount to probable cause. Um, there was the SPD Twitter I found really shocking. There was just open lying with uh, incontrovertible video evidence that I think opened a lot of people's eyes to the fact that um, the cops aren't always who they say they are. And then on top of that, um, the recognition that there's no consequences. There's literally almost no consequences for un unlawfully arresting someone. Um, and if there is, those consequences are borne by the city through uh, tax dollars. Um, and uh, there, therefore there's really no, there's no, um, there's no, gosh, I'm sorry. There's no impetus for corrective behavior. There's, um, I, I don't think, I don't believe that consequences are everything, but I do believe that in this case, we've seen um, with qualified immunity, we've seen just how far um, not holding people accountable can go and what it leads to. And I think what it leads to now is, you know, murder, you know, um, and, and it's going to continue until there are some sort of avenues of personal accountability put into place for police officers in their department. So yes, I absolutely, absolutely would support an end to qualified immunity. Great, thank you so much. And I'm gonna place question number two into the chat. And Mackenzie. Okay. Thank you. Um, no, I don't. I don't at all. Uh, one second, Nicole. Uh, uh, okay. if, if I could just read it out loud, and this will just be because of uh, the people that are going to watch this later on YouTube, so they won't be able to read the question. So I'm just going to verbally okay. ask it. Perfect. But that's great for being on top of it, though. Um, 
So do you support the city sweeping of homeless encampments? If not, what concrete steps would you take to stop the sweeps? Um, I don't support the sweeping of the homeless encampments. Um, I will say personally, I, um, I gave away several tents, like my family's uh, camping tents this summer and watched them get loaded into the back of a uh, garbage truck. And um, when those camps were swept and I, um, the thing with the sweeps is there's no point. The, with, they just move things around. And not only do they move, um, move the problem around, but they rob the people that have almost nothing already of what little stability they already have. So um, I think that there's, there's support for things like building tiny houses. There's a for, uh, support for affordable housing. Um, and I think that we need to take the money away from, uh, there's, why are we spending money on sweeps? That's, it's just ridiculous. It's, um, it doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make sense from a public safety perspective. So I know that um, there's things being done in terms of getting people into hotel rooms right now. And I would support that. I would support the building of tiny house villages. I would support um, an end to single family zoning so we can create some more affordable housing here. And in the meantime, because I understand that, um, that those aren't things that are gonna happen overnight. In the meantime, I would support the mutual aid workers that are working in these encampments. Um, I think one of the um, quotes that stuck out to me this uh, summer from the sweeps was uh, a mutual aid, aid worker saying, I got pepper sprayed in the face while making a fruit salad. There's just no, there's no reason for that. People need to eat, they need to live. I think we need to support the mutual aid workers that are on the ground. Um, we need to make sure that the people that are currently camping are supported, that they have a place to go to the bathroom, that the trash is being picked up regularly, that there is outreach at like non-coercive outreach happening at those places. And so that would, um, that because a lot of times when I hear people complain about the sweeps, they're complaining about um, the trash, the bathroom issue, um, and the public safety issue. And I don't really see um, people being unsheltered, the same as a public safety issue. I think that there's things that we can do to reduce the harm um, of trash pickup, bathroom issues, um, and then also um, reduce issues of public safety by making sure that people who are living there have what they need to survive. Great, thank you so much. And a question, number three, and I believe that was Katie. Um, should the city change its approach to prosecuting misdemeanor offenses? Will you file charges for drug possession? Uh, will I file charges for drug possession? No, no, I won't. Um, and should the city change its approach to misdemeanors? Absolutely. Um, I believe uh, that most misdemeanor charges don't, don't need to happen. Um, a lot of them are crimes of survival. Um, like stealing a sandwich, sleeping in a doorway. Um, and those, those are things that are not gonna be ameliorated by prosecution. Um, and I think, yeah, for drug possession, like, I'll, I mean, I'll be honest, as a public defender, I would have, if I had clients that wanted to go into drug court, more often people wanted to go into drug court, not so much to escape charges because they're probably already in a pretty bad place, but because they were provided housing. That was generally the big um, motivator for people going into drug court. And so I know that there is this idea that if people aren't, um, you know, aren't, there's no stick to drive them into drug treatment, they won't go. But um, in my experience, that's not what I've seen. Um, what I see is a lot of my clients needing help with drug treatment and not able to get it. Um, getting into treatment is a really hard thing to do. It's an incredibly hard thing to do on your own without any sort of case management services. It's expensive. There's rarely beds open. So at the times that people are ready to go to treatment, it's something that's not there for them. And then there's other times like when prosecuting drug offenses or things like that, um, the idea is that people will get into treatment. And I don't think forced treatment is what is actually going to help with those problems. Um, I think the more you force treatment on people that don't want it, um, the less likely they are that, to seek that help in the future if, if, it is, if it's even available. 
And uh, drug possession, drug use is a public health problem. It should not be a criminal problem. Um, and I, I just, with every, almost every other misdemeanor, I think that there is a way of dealing with it that's more effective, that's more cost effective, um, and that results in a lot less harm to people caught up in addiction, but also to the community as well. Um, I think that we should be focusing on harm reduction, open and available treatment to all people, and getting people off the streets. Because even if you are in active addiction, um, if you're still living on the street, there's, it's, it's, it's really, it seems pretty impossible to me. That's so, I mean, there's just, there's, yeah, I've just heard a lot that it seems like it's, it's really impossible to get clean if you're still living on the street. So I would also support low barrier housing. That seems to be what works for people. Thank you so much. Uh, question number four, and I believe next was Sherry. Do you support ranked choice voting for Seattle's elections? And what would you do, if you do, it, to make ranked choice voting a reality in Seattle? I absolutely support ranked choice voting. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I mean, first past the post type winner takes all is um, not working out really so much for us. And I think especially in a, in a very divided community, um, being forced to make a choice between two people that don't actually maybe support all of your values. Um, I think it keeps people from running. I think, um, yeah, and I think that it, it's, you know, it forces a false choice where there shouldn't be. In terms of what I could do to support ranked choice voting, I mean, any legislation that was put forward to do so uh, would be something that I would absolutely support. Um, I can't, you know what, I won't say that. I was gonna say, I can't see legal challenges to that, but actually I, I can, there's legal challenges to everything. And so if that's what the city wanted to do, um, you know, I would advocate for that strongly and I would support and defend any um, legislation that the city passed to make that a reality. I mean, as a city attorney, that's really all I can do. I mean, is, is advocate and defend um, the city's choices. Um, I would like to, you know, it would be great to do it for the state of Washington and King County and, but, um, but as a city attorney, that's, um, that's what I would do is use the power and influence of my office and also the, um, the available litigation to support any, um, any move towards ranked choice voting. Great. Thank you so much. So now we're going to move into, um, Question, just um, open question and answer. And the responses to these questions would be one minute apiece. And uh, board members are welcome to raise their hand if they have any questions. And I have some questions, so I'm trying to pull them up. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mackenzie, thank you. Hi, so thank you. Um, a question I have is uh, Pete Holmes has been in his position for quite a while, the incumbent that you're running against. Just kind of give you an opportunity to um, separate yourself from him and some things that you would do different, or are there certain things that you specifically done that you don't agree with that you would do different? Um, I, I really think that there's really not very many similarities between um, Pete Holmes and I, in, in terms of our policy positions, um, there's there's great things that Pete Holmes has done um, in terms of getting ICE out of the jails and um, uh, making DWLS three, decriminalizing that. Um, I'm not going to say he hasn't done some great things, but I think the difference between Pete Holmes and I is that I am not I am not running on a platform of press progressive or um, liberal prosecution, I am advocating for non-prosecution in um, the city attorney's office for all misdemeanors. I think that, um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? I was uh, just going to so say that I think basically that, just like that, kind of separating yourself from him and the differences between the two of you. So like if there's um, somebody watching this that's a big Pete Holmes fan, um, why mm -hmm. should they vote for you instead? Okay. Um, so yeah, I think that the fact that I wouldn't prosecute misdemeanors is like the thing that would set me the most apart from Pete Holmes. Um, and I think that um, while I understand that Pete Holmes is seen as uh, 
as a Democrat and maybe a more liberal, um, on the liberal end of things, my experience working in Seattle Municipal Court was not that at all. Um, the people that were pro prosecuted were BIPOC, were the poor, were the disabled. Um, and there was really almost um, no situation that I felt that the city attorneys didn't make worse. I know that the city attorneys like to believe that they are matching people with services and encouraging people to go into treatment and things of that nature. And um, that's just not what I saw. That's not what I saw with my clients. I saw people being destabilized. I saw people losing everything. Um, you know, working poor people that lived in their cars that lost their jobs and then couldn't move their cars, their cars got towed, they lost everything. There's nothing about that that improves the lives of the person being prosecuted or even the, um, the victims of whatever crimes. Um, I think that the, um, I also think that crime victims should be treated in a different way. You know, at this point they don't have, there is a victim bill of rights, but for the most part, in prosecutions, they're, they're used to testify against um, the defendant and relive that trauma. And I think that there's, um, I, I think that there's resources in that office that could be used to better serve the needs of people who have been victimized. So that's what would set me apart. Thank you. Uh, Summer. Hi, uh, and again, those questions are one minute apiece. Yes. And right, I office. I have a question and I am a little embarrassed because I don't fully understand exactly how much authority the city attorney has. And I'm an attorney myself <laughs> um, in my last day of work for the federal government. Um, so I'm, I would love to understand a little bit more, especially around question number two, um, the question about the homeless encampment sweeps and what concrete steps can you, or, or the, as if you were to be elected as a city attorney, take to stop the sweeps? Because I've been really concerned about um, hearing from the current city attorney, like I can't, you know, he, he, he'll say, I can't step into that, that's not my role. And mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes that's a little bit self-limiting. And mm -hmm. so we'd like to know um, what the city attorney can do that maybe isn't being done right now um, regarding homeless sweeps or when there's a law passed uh, such as Jumpstart Seattle to tax um, and then how direct how it's spent by the um, city council, then our mayor decides not to or our mayor decides that she wants to um, give the order that uh, people be tear gassed. Uh, you know, all of which I disagree with. I want, I, I'm really curious about the city attorney's authority and I'm embarrassed I don't know. <laughs> so we'd love to have you respond as to what you see the authority and also um, how you would use that authority differently. Sure, so that's a really good question. Um, and as uh, an attorney myself, I don't fully, I, I mean, knowing the scope of um, a body's authority is always a legal question that needs research and things of that nature. I think that, um, you know, the city attorney does not direct the Seattle Police Department in their policies and behaviors and activities. I think that um, I know that there has been some um, sweeps without court orders. Um, that I, I, um, I think that's something that the city attorney could deal with in terms of um, some litigation with, I mean, it's, it sounds strange, I think, to um, engage in lit litigation with the Seattle Police Department, but that's not something I would be opposed to doing. Um, I also, um, I know that, that there is a reluctance to, um, by the city attorney to wade into those conversations. And I understand that from a political point of view, um, but I also don't share that value. Um, I don't, I would not mind at all being very vocal and wading into that conversation and using the privilege of the city attorney's position to um, advocate for, for that sort of thing. I also, the relationship with the city attorney, with the city attorney and the Seattle Police Department is complicated. You know, on one hand, the city attorney is tasked with defending officers who um, maybe sued for misconduct or things of that nature. And that is, um, that is something that I, that's a really thorny question. Um, and I, I will say that I am, you know, I'm, 
I'm an abolitionist, I believe in abolishing the police. And I think that um, the power of the office, I think in terms of what could be done legally would take a lot of research and it would take sort of, I think some creative legal arguments that I would absolutely love to take on. Um, but I think just not wading into the conversation um, because it's not in maybe the purview of the office, I think is a, I mean, it's just a cop out that I wouldn't take. Um, this, the city attorney's office is supposed to be concerned with public safety. And so it's absolutely a public safety issue. The um, citizens who live in homeless encampments are, are, are residents of Seattle and they deserve the same protection that uh, any other resident of Seattle does. Great, thank you so much. And with that, we are out of time. So if you would like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up um, and tell folks at home uh, why they should support you. Thanks. Sure. Um, I think people should support, well, if you believe in abolition, then you should definitely support me because that is what, um, what I would like to see in my plan moving forward. I don't think that we need all these prosecutors to, I, we don't need to be prosecuting misdemeanors. We don't need all the prosecutors. We don't need all the defense attorneys. We need people that uh, know how to work with these communities, that um, we need to pour resources into housing more than anything else. Um, I think housing, harm reduction, and making treat non-coercive treatment available to people um, are the things that are going to actually result in public safety because there's no point in prosecuting people um, that don't have a place to live for trespass or hungry people for stealing a sandwich um, or mentally ill people for calling 911 too many times. There's, there's nothing about that that solves the problem. Um, and even if we were to look at it from a business point of view, can, to continue to try to do things this way when it's so obviously a failure is just folly. We need to make some changes. And I'm not talking about incremental reform. I'm talking about some big sweeping changes where we start caring for people instead of putting them in cages and stop confusing punishment with justice. Great, thank you so much.